Okay, uh, welcome everyone. We'll, we'll kick off for this uh, this Friday's uh, seminar. Uh, I'm uh, Yadvin Damali, Director of the Levy Hume Centre for Nature Recovery, and our speaker, Catherine Brown, uh, she can't be here in person today because of train strikes uh, that have created a, a problem, but she, as you can see, she is online and, and joining in. But your reward for turning up in person rather than jogging online is we still have the drinks reception and nibbles afterwards, so you can still have your your wine and conversation and regrettably without Catherine there, but hopefully we'll, we'll catch her sometime. But we have discussed that she may join us for one of the future seminars as a guest in a couple of weeks time. So if you want to specifically in, uh, socialize or interact with her, she, she'll be around in a few weeks time, probably at the Charlie Burrell uh, uh, seminar. Uh, okay, just, uh, so before I introduce uh, uh, our, our guest, uh, I'll just mention some of the other seminars we've got coming up. Uh, for this uh, term. Uh, next week, we've got Sophia Gomez and Vincent Merckx on uh, below ground plant fungal interactions in forests. Uh, the following week, we've got Bob Costanza on, over on his new book, Overcoming Our Societal Addiction to Growth and to Build, to build a Sustainable Wellbeing Future. And uh, I'll just mention one thing that we're planning before that event seminar, which should be great as well, is a debate at lunchtime. We haven't quite fixed time and place, but probably around one o'clock here, but we're there's still some negotiation going on, which would be a debate on, uh, is it a good thing to put an economic value on nature? And that'll be Bob Costanza on one side, Eric gomez Bagaton on the other, and Kate Woolworth as chair. So that should be quite, a, quite an interesting debate. Uh, so it'll happen, it'll certainly be happening sometime that, that, that day, uh, and we'll, we'll confirm the exact uh, uh, time. Uh, and then the following week on the Friday the 24th, we have Charlie Burrell on rewilding. Uh, as Charlie is head of the, the NEP rewilding uh, program. Uh, then the following one, we don't have anything on the Friday, but on the following Monday, on the 6th of March, we have Patrick Greenfield from The Guardian about the recent article and uh, about uh, uh, avoided deforestation credits and whether they're functional or not, and some of the debate around that. That'll be at 5 p.m. That'll, that'll be a slightly, a slightly later time as well. Uh, and then on the 10th of March, we have Michael DePledge from the University of Exeter on and the environment and health. And then on, on the following week, probably on the 17th, but they're still, still, still narrowing down the exact date, uh, we have Sandra Diaz from the University of Cordoba, Cordoba uh, who's the Vice Chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And she'll be talking about biodiversity and international governance in, in, some, uh, in the COP15. So a really nice array of people. And Sandra will be here in person as well. For that. So all of these will be in, in person uh, seminars. So a really, really uh, um, a fascinating array. We're already putting together an agenda for next term seminars. So over to our guest for today. Uh, Catherine Brown is Director for Climate Change and Evidence at, at the Wildlife Trust. That's a role that she's been in for about a year. But uh, she's got plenty of uh, wealth of experience from before then. She uh, did her undergraduate degree in Natural Sciences and Zoology at Cambridge and a Master's in International Development at UCL. And then for, she's had a variety of roles broadly in climate and pol science and policy. For 10 years, she was at DEFRA. And then she was at the Climate Change Committee for 10 years as head of adaptation at the, at the, uh, at the Climate Change Committee. And, uh, uh, and she's worked on every UK climate change risk assessment and led the most recent third assessment in 2021. And recently she was awarded an OBE for services to climate change research. So congratulations on that. So, Thank you, Catherine, for, for making it online and over to you. Thank you very much, Yvinder, and, and apologies again, everyone, um, particularly those of you in the room for, for not being there in person. But yeah, I've been defeated by the rail strikes today, unfortunately. But as Yvinder said, I'm hoping to come along um, to the lecture on the 24th of February. So if anybody would like to have a chat in person, um, it'd be great to see you then. So hopefully it won't be too um, distracting to, to have me um, as a talking head on the screen today. So I'm going to share my slides. Um, so hopefully that has worked and you can all see them. Um, you might not be able to see me now, but hopefully you can hear me speaking. Um, so as Stephen just said, I'm uh, Director of Climate Change and Evidence at the Wildlife Trusts, and it's quite a new role. Um, for, for the Wildlife Trust. I've been in post just over a year uh, and I'll speak a little bit about why that, that role has come about and, and what I do. And today, um, Yvinda and the team have asked me to focus on 
some of our work around our strategy, our work on nature-based solutions in particular, um, and also some of the obviously evidence-based challenges mainly that we have in trying to implement on the ground, um, what I've spent many years looking at in terms of policy and implementation and evaluation at DEFRA and the Climate Change Committee as well. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about was just a bit of background as to where the wildlife trusts have come from and, and really what we look like today. And it's been really nice actually joining an organisation with such a long uh, and um, established history in wildlife conservation. Um, obviously, as a, as a zoologist who's been working on climate change for 20 years, it's been really nice to all this come back to my roots. And I really love that we have such a long history. And this slide is just showing you um, the Charter of Incorporation from 1916, which is when the Wildlife Trust was set up as the Society for the Promotion and Preservation of Nature Reserves. Uh, and for those of you who like a bit of conservation history, this came from the work of Charles Rothschild, who set up the Rothschild Reserves after a meeting at the Natural History Museum in 1912. Um, and the idea behind this new conservation organization was, as you can see on the slide, to identify and um, keep intact uh, areas that had special um, rarity of wildlife or special significance for conservation as well. So it's the Wildlife Trust have very much come from a background of keeping things as they were, keeping things um, in stasis and trying to avoid extinction of specific species. So um, that's what we looked like in 1916, um, obviously very small, but we're set up as a set of charities. And the Wildlife Trust really have grown since then quite significantly. Um, and today, uh, this is what we look like now. So we're a federation of 47 different charities across the UK. Uh, and what that means is we're all different legal entities, um, but we have a shared a shared brand, obviously shared motivation, and we have a shared strategy, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. But I think one of the things from joining the wildlife trusts that really surprised me was just how big big the wildlife trusts are. I didn't have any idea. So um, you hear a lot about RSPV and national trust and how much land they hold, but we're also one of the top ten landholders in the UK as a federation. We don't often show up on the lists because we are 47 different charities, but we're definitely up there in terms of uh, the area that we have. So uh, round about 100,000 hectares of land, um, over 2,000, 2,300 nature reserves, uh, over 3,000 staff and 37,000 active volunteers. And we've just passed the 900,000 mark on our membership. So I think we have about 913,000 members at the moment so we're we're eyeing up the million uh the million member point if anybody isn't a member of their local wildlife trust and would like to um it's not that expensive to join for the year so do look that up uh if you're interested and bbow which is obviously the local wildlife trust for oxfordshire is a fantastic trust um and also uh my local wildlife trust as well and we've certainly grown in terms of income uh and delivery particularly on um the more modern projects like nature-based solutions. So our annual turnover is in the region of 150 million pounds. And a lot of that comes in from grant money, from lottery, from government, uh, from members, obviously, um, and from private donors as well. And as you would expect, most of it is spent directly on nature conservation. So we're quite light in terms of um, staff and, and sort of things like built assets compared to maybe some other conservation charities. And these two maps I've put up on this slide just show you both uh, where our nature reserves are located. So they really are across the whole of the UK. That's the map on the left um, everywhere, including Alderney, um, the Isles of Scilly, all the way up to the top of Scotland and in the Shetland Islands. Uh, and on the right is just the map showing you the, the boundaries of the different uh, wildlife trusts. So some are tiny, actually Alderney and Isles of Scilly wildlife trusts have about three or four members of staff each up to Yorkshire, which is an enormous trust that has, I think, over 150 members of staff. And we have an entire Wildlife Trust for Scotland, Scottish Wildlife Trust, one for uh, Northern Ireland, Ulster Wildlife Trust, and we have five for Wales, interestingly. Um, and this partly comes about just from the history of the gathering together of these different trusts that we're looking at the promotion of nature reserves. So it just gives you a sense of that we span the whole of the UK. So we span every corner of the UK, every area, uh, has its own wildlife trust um, and we're quite uh, well equipped with a large number of nature reserves as well. We last year published our first 
uh, joint strategy for quite some time. So this is our uh, aims and objectives up to 2030. And it's quite a special document in that it is the joint strategy of all of the wildlife trusts together, including the Royal Society of Wildlife Trust, where I work, which is the, the central national team, which coordinates action and deals with a lot of the national uh, evidence needs, national research, national fundraising, um, and policy and advocacy as well. Uh, and it's quite interesting in that if you think back to that, that document of incorporation in 1916, where it was very much about preserving and conserving um, specific areas for their nature value, that still is very core and fundamental to the aims of the Wildlife Trust. So our char charitable objectives are still very much about preserving and uh, restoring nature. But we've moved also very much into modern times with engagement with people and with nature-based solutions. So thinking about how nature can help us to address local and global problems. And those are reflected across the strategic goals in our 2030 strategy. So goal one, nature is in recovery, is still quite um, uh, embedded in, in those traditional conservation objectives, but really it's not just about keeping things as they were anymore. And as we know in a changing climate, that's now impossible in any case. But this is very much about trying to reverse the, the really striking trend of biodiversity loss that we've seen uh, across, the, the, across the world, obviously, but across the UK, um, nearly a 70% reduction in biodiversity since 1970, according to the, uh, the Global State of Nature report. And as well as recovering and restoring nature, trying to restore those natural processes so that we create, particularly um, with the ethos of the Wild, Wildlife Trust, we create these wilder spaces, um, mainly on land, but, but um, uh, from a marine point of view as well. So we don't obviously own any marine areas, but we do a lot of work on marine conservation restoration. And we have a very active marine conservation team um, in RSWT and the central team that also look at a lot of work on uh, damage to marine habitats and pressures on, on marine ecosystems from everything from bottom trawling to offshore wind. Um, so we, we have a really, really active marine component. And I think some of the largest marine restoration programs out of any nature conservation organization in the UK. But as I said, we've really branched out as well into a lot of work on engaging with communities, community led action. So not telling people how they should think about nature and what they should do to restore nature but really enabling people to take their own action and to take meaningful action for wildlife. I'll come back to that one later, because uh, what counts as meaningful action is, is a really interesting topic for debate. Um, and that's at all levels. So I think we are, uh, we are the organisation that engages with the largest number of school children across the UK on nature conservation. Um, we have a load of outdoor learning programmes. We do a lot around things like social prescribing for health conditions, um, whole programmes of work that look at um, helping with people's mental health through uh, contact with nature. Um, and a lot on dealing with deprived communities uh, and elderly people as well and trying to reconnect them with nature and through that obviously helping with social connection as well. So the Wildlife Trust are very, very active in, in on that side with people taking meaningful action. And the third area is the one I look after. So um, goal three is about nature playing a central and valued role in global and local problems. So nature-based solutions for climate change is in there, um, obviously, but that's not all that, that's covered in nature-based solutions. So we've got um, nature's role in promoting health, um, all of the evidence that sits around that, uh, nature's role in, in instilling food security, water security, um, all those sorts of issues for people are, are embedded in goal three. Uh, so that's the one I'm going to talk about most today, and given my role as well, mostly from a climate change angle, um, but very happy to take questions on, on any of those goals. Um, and then, yeah, underpinning that, we've got a whole set of what we call transformations and enabling priorities, and these are about how we work as a federation and with government and with corporate partners and with academia as well to implement uh, those three goals at the top. So that covers everything from making sure um, from my area making sure we're evidence-based in everything that we're doing and I'd say the wildlife trusts are very very good at that but I'll come back to that obviously in terms of some of the challenges we have um ensuring that uh we have uh proper funding in place and fundraising and new funding models and new innovations in funding is something that we're being very active with at the moment 
um, to undergoing a digital transformation and really trying to bring up the Wildlife Trust to uh, make the most use we can really out of all the digital resources that are available to us now. Obviously, keeping costs down is a really big um, priority for us as a charity. And there's all kinds of new innovations and technologies that we can be harnessing um, with, with help from partners to try and ensure that we're, we're making the most of that and being as efficient as we can. So that just gives you a sense, I guess, of where we're coming from. And underpinning this strategy, we have a whole set of uh, KPIs, if you like, <clears throat> and impact measures that it's also part of my job as director of evidence to lead on our measurement of how we're, how successful we're being, what our impact has been. Um, so that cuts across, uh, cuts across the climate change work, obviously, but it cuts across everything we do. So my evidence part of my role is really about understanding <clears throat> our impact excuse me, um, and understanding the gaps and how we measure progress across all of our goals and transformations and priorities. Um, so that's all available on our website if anybody wants to have a, a little bit more of a look at that. Uh, and what we do each year is we publish, um, sorry, go back one, we publish an impact report that tries to assess and, uh, and communicate and give really nice storyline examples of some of the impact that we're having. So I thought I would just show you the impact report from last year and particularly on our, our nature-based solutions work. Um, and we're starting to do some quite interesting things around this. So one of the things that I've actually been talking to the uh, to Steve Smith's team at Oxford today about is thinking about how we measure our emissions and removals across our land. Um, and for the first time, we've started doing things like trying to estimate the greenhouse gas removers from all of our woodlands uh, across our nature reserves. Our best guess at that at the minute is that it's at least 37,000 tonnes of carbon per year. So those are the sorts of measurements that we're getting more and more interested in as we move into much more of a climate change space. But we have all kinds of indicators from amounts of spend on different types of nature-based solutions. So last year we spent over £2 million just on natural flood management projects alone, over 160 natural flood management projects across the Trust. So it gives you a sense of the scale at which we're operating. Um, we also try and count things like what our volunteers are doing, so how many hours we've spent uh, with volunteers out on reserves, um, the number of hours that people have been involved with our health led programs uh, and the number of people visiting our reserves obviously is a big one as well. Um, and all of this gives us a sense that we're moving forward on nature based solutions and one of the things that we're really keen to do is to derive that innovation and try and push forward areas where we think probably government action is not not high enough but we're wanting to be the test cases for those sorts of new nature-based solutions um, but doing that obviously from my point of view in particular in a very robust evidence-based way taking account of all the global standards that are coming through uh, and making sure that we're showing what can be done and how it can be done robustly uh, as well as some of the pitfalls and, and actually communicating some of the pitfalls of doing this work to the trust and to wider communities and to our corporate partners is a big part of our job as well. So we're very alive to that side of um, understanding the role and the potential for nature-based solutions and also the limitations as well. That's another piece of work we've um, we've been quite active with Nat Seddon's team uh, at Oxford to, to think about the potential for nature-based solutions and some of the limitations. So her work and, and that of her team, some of you might be involved in that as well. So thank you if you have been, but that's fed through very much into our strategy and our, our thinking about how we build these programmes uh, in, a, in a sensible way. Um, I wanted to take you through just a few examples of some of the more innovative work that's that's going on, just also obviously in case anyone's particularly interested in these and would like to talk about them further. But also just to give you a sense of the breadth of, of what we do and what we're trying to achieve uh, through nature-based solutions. The first one is actually something that was announced this week. So I'm really, really pleased that um, the announcement for this came out on Tuesday because it obviously means I can speak to you about it today. Um, we've just announced a £38 million programme to restore Atlantic rainforest across the UK. And this is a really interesting programme in that uh, it's being funded entirely by a private donor. So Aviva, the insurance company, is, is funding the entire programme. Um, it's, we think, one of the largest, if the not largest, private donations for a nature-based solutions project. 
And really importantly for me and, and for the Wildlife Trust as well, it's a multi-benefit project. And what that means is Aviva are not funding us just to produce one thing, whether it's carbon or biodiversity uplift. It's very much about the full benefits um, of restoring rainforest across the UK. So in our, uh, in our KPIs for this program, we've got everything, um, climate change adaptation, which is mostly what I've been working on for the last 15 years or so, that's very firmly embedded in the program. There are carbon metrics, there are biodiversity metrics, and there's a whole load of metrics around social impact uh, and community involvement in these schemes. So the idea being that these areas will become nature reserves. They will obviously have public access and communities will, will absolutely be at the heart of the creation of these new habitats. Um, it's a really exciting one for us. It's probably the biggest example uh, of a nature-based solutions program that, that we have started to implement. Um, and it's a hundred year program as well. So it's it's a very interesting one to set up when you're thinking about what the world might look like in a hundred years time and making sure that the program is set up to be able to, to cope with that, that kind of length of um, agreement between two parties. So as you can imagine, it's been quite 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 an involved process to think through how to how to do this and how to make it robust. But we're incredibly excited about it. So I've put the link in the slides to the um, the Channel Four announcement the other day, which was a really lovely piece they did, um, setting actually alongside uh, my former team's work, so the Climate Change Committee's uh, adaptation finance report. Which again, if any of you are interested in finance for nature based solutions, do go and have a look at that report. That was also published on Tuesday. And really set out the size of the gap, uh, the, the gulf really between um, ambition and what's needed on climate change adaptation and the actual funding coming through. Uh, and Channel 4 did a really nice piece that can that combine those two stories together. So do go and have a look at that um, if you missed it. And the map on this page just shows you the, the extent of where the bioclimatic envelope for uh, Atlantic rainforest is. Sadly, this is not the same as the map of where it actually is um, today. So only about 1% um, of our Atlantic rainforest remains uh, due to land degradation, farming, um, and a load of other pressures. So really this program is about recreating and trying to join up those pockets of, of rainforest habitat across the west of the UK. Um, there's a lot more detail that sits behind it. I'm very happy to take questions on it, but yeah, that's a, a really exciting one that I'm really pleased to be able to, to talk about now. and. Got a few other examples um, in terms of different sizes of different projects and looking at different objectives. This next one is uh, at Pegston Nature Reserve in Bedfordshire. This is a, a Bedfordshire, Cambridgeshire, and Northamptonshire Wildlife Trust example. Um, also a really nice one. This was uh, featured on Country File back in August, and it's still available on the iPlayer again if anyone's particularly interested in this kind of project. Um, they did a really nice piece on how nature-based solutions can help wildlife to withstand heatwave conditions. Uh, and they featured um, the butterfly banks at Pegston, which is this one, as well as a whole load of other programs that the Wildlife Trust are implementing on chalk streams and reducing wildfire risk as well. Uh, so again, I've put the link uh, for the, the, the program on that, which gives some really nice visuals as well to, to look at how, how this project is going. This is one that BCN are doing with University of Cambridge um, to do the background research on. And the idea behind it is in, I mean, you can see from the, the slide what the landscape looks like here, but there are very, very open um, chalk-based meadows and grasslands, which have uh, a whole bounty of species of butterflies, um, some of them quite rare. And the project is trying to create microclimates to help them uh, withstand extreme conditions and, and in this example particularly heatwave conditions. So BCN have created four butterfly banks uh, in the middle of the Pegston Reserve um, and all they are, I mean they're quite simple, they're just mounds of earth um, that they've exca excavated up uh, and shaped in a kind of u-shape and they've got four that are all pointing in different directions so they've got all north, south, east, west aspects covered. And what they're doing is looking at how those uh, butterfly banks are colonized by vegetation and then what that does to the behavior of the butterflies on site. Um, and when we went to film there for Country File, it was a 37 degree day last year in August. So actually, we actually got to see them in action as well. And as you can see from the photos, I mean, they've only just done this. These, these banks are about a year old and they weren't expecting any real changes um, in, in, in the vegetation on the banks or the butterfly behavior. 
for sort of five to 10 years, but actually they're already seeing changes in behavior. And the fact that butterflies are using the banks and using the cool spaces that they're creating uh, to, to stay out of the heat. Um, and some of the research that the team are doing, they're actually going out and taking the butterflies temperature, um, which we were doing the day that, that Country File uh, films there. Um, and as well as uh, a pair of mating butterflies, which if any of you know the species for these, I'd be grateful because I've been racking my brains trying to remember, but I'm sure somebody in the audience probably knows. Um, we did see mating behavior. They were, there were a lot of butterflies on the wing given it was 37 degrees. And it was all because they, they had these banks uh, to help them move, move across the field and the landscape. So they're obviously having an effect already, but this is a very experimental project to see uh, what happens over the next five to 10 years. So it just gives you a sense as well, some of the, the more climate change adaptation related work that the wildlife trusts are doing. Um, another climate change adaptation example that I really like is more about coming back to our people focus and community-based adaptation in particular. This is one that Somerset Wildlife Trust are running. It's called Adapting the Levels, and it's a community-led adaptation program looking at how communities can decide for themselves what the future adaptation strategy for a landscape should be and how to use nature um, as a way of helping them cope with future conditions. So this is a, this is a long-term program, it's mainly lottery funded, uh, but this example I've just put up on the slide just shows you some of the work that the Trust have been doing with the local community on the levels. This is for Wedmore, um, really beautiful village just on the edge of the Somerset levels. And the Trust have been working with the community to come up with um, sustainable urban drainage uh, solutions for, for the village hall and for the town itself. And thinking about what sorts of uh, nature-based projects should go where and what kind of benefits they would have. Um, the idea being that, that now they've done that community involvement, they can go to, to the local authority and to other funders and, and, and talk about how those projects can have benefits for the local community. So it's very much people-led uh, and community-led adaptation. Uh, but they've done some really nice visuals and part, I think, of the, the challenge we have with nature-based solutions um, is really visualizing what, what the future could look like that's actually positive. Uh, because with the threat of climate change and biodiversity loss, it can often be very difficult to imagine a future where, where we do see positive change because there's been so little of that over the last couple of decades. And projects like these are really nice for coming up with that visual representation. Uh, there's a lot of analysis again going on about the, the evaluation of how this is helping the community to kind of cope with the threat from climate change, particularly in this area around sea level rise and flooding, obviously. Um, but also how, again, reconnecting them with nature and, and bringing more nature in. I mean, obviously Wedmore is not what you would call an urban area, but it's certainly um, got a lot of concrete in places. So bringing nature into those sorts of communities and seeing how it can benefit people's health and well-being, uh, as well as help them deal with climate hazards. Um, and this fourth example is one from Sheffield and Rotherham Wildlife Trust. This is a, a natural flood management scheme that I went to look at back in November. Um, and it's for the Lim Valley. So those of you, uh, if you know Sheffield, you'll know it's um, a big, a big city, a big industrial city that sits in a valley surrounded by hills and has really severe floods risk issues, um, have had some horrendous floods in historic times that have led to a lot of loss of life. Um, and there is a lot of engineered flood solutions around Sheffield. But the, the local authority, the Environment Agency and the Wildlife Trust are really trying to start um, upping their game on natural flood management and natural flood solutions as well. So this example is one of the projects around the city for the Lynn Valley, which just sits uh, behind the trees that you can see in the photo there. Um, and this one really is about creating new flood storage ponds, new swales, uh, new routes for water to take when it's running off the hillside. This is actually, it was a football pitch. Um, up in this park and the football pitch is still there. They've just moved it a bit further up um, and have started creating this, this natural flood management scheme. Uh, there's a lot of archeological um, remnants here as well. So it's also a really interesting example of how you do uh, nature conservation and, um, and heritage together. Uh, and the third thing about it I really like is there's a lot of education material that goes with it. So the post on the right of the the slide here is one of the fixed photography points where they encourage people to put their phones on top of the, the post in a very specific place 
uh, take a picture and send it to the project mailbox so that they've got a record of how the landscape is changing over time. Um, it's a really nice one because apparently when loads of school trips go there, they all the kids are obviously doing this and, and the project gets about 50 emails all with the same photo all at once. Um, so they do sometimes have, have a bit of a job on their hands to try and go through everything. But I think that's a really interesting bit of innovation on how you can involve children and local communities as well to actually help you collect the data uh, that you need for projects like this. Um, and obviously there's a lot of measurement going on to see how this reduces blood risk downstream. So not only have we got on top of the hill this kind of redirecting of water and, um, and excavating going on, but within the valley itself in the forested area, you can see behind there's lots of leaky dams being put in. Uh, the Wildlife Trust are working really hard with the local rangers for the site to think about public access and um, how to do vegetation management to try and slow the flow of water off the hillside and down into the city, um, which is sitting behind the trees. So lots and lots of different things going on with this one. It's a really good partnership project. Um, and this has all been lottery funded as well. Um, so yeah, lottery has done a huge number actually of nature-based solutions over the last few years or so. So that just gives you a sense, I guess, of some of the work that we're doing. And as I said, you know, there's hundreds, if not thousands of these projects going on across the country from different wildlife trusts, all focusing on different aspects and, um, and very much with a, a people focus and, and a monitoring and evaluation focus as well. The, the second part of what I wanted to talk about was some of the challenges and the barriers we have to, to implementing nature-based solutions and for our work in general. And, and there are so many of these that I've I can't really go through all of them, but um, if you've heard of a challenge or a barrier, I'm sure we're experiencing it. But I've tried to pick out four that might be most relevant for thinking about any potential collaborations um, with you or, or areas where your own research could, could maybe help us to solve a problem. So the first is about getting, getting the right evidence in the first place um, to inform our work. The second is about the translation of that into practical action on the ground. So I've got a few examples of that. Uh, there's a whole load of uh, challenges and barriers around monitoring and measuring um, what we do. Uh, and there's a, a pet topic of mine I just want to cover at the end, which is all around tunnel vision, um, which I'll explain in a bit more detail. So to go through those in turn, um, one of the things we've been really keen to do at the Wildlife Trust is understand how the trusts themselves approach use of evidence and particularly conservation evidence. Um, and we actually held a programme uh, over the last couple of years called the Evidence Emergency Project um, to match the climate emergency work that we've been doing. The idea behind this is to really understand uh, the extent to which wildlife trusts are using robust core evidence in the work they do and the barriers that they feel they have um, in trying to implement the right actions. Um, and I just want to show you a couple of outputs from that project. So that's just finished and we've published a first report and we're now um, looking for opportunities for funding to do a second implementation phase. Uh, this word cloud just shows you some of the, the words that the different trusts associated with conservation evidence, <clears throat> which looks about right to me. So I think, you know, most of the trusts know, know the, all, a lot of the theory um, behind how to do conservation well and how to... Um, uh, ascertain its effectiveness in different settings. But that being said, um, this was the result of, of a, a survey of all of the Wildlife Trusts to ask them whether they thought the work of the Wildlife Trusts was evidence-led. Um, now, this isn't a terrible result, but it, I, I didn't find it surprising that actually quite a big percentage of people either weren't really sure whether our work is evidence-led or actually um, nearly 20%, particularly on the provision of ecological evidence, disagrees that, that the work of the Wildlife Trust is evidence-led. Uh, and that was a really interesting finding and, and not surprising, I think. When we looked into this more, we also found there was quite a big split um, between more senior management levels uh, and people working on the ground, like nature reserve managers. So I think if you ask this question to Wildlife Trust CEOs, nearly every single CEO would say that the work that we do across the world by trust is evidence-led. If you ask um, nature reserve managers uh, and uh, reserve wardens and people working on the ground, you get a very different answer. Um, and this reflects both, both sides of that. So all, 
all types of role across the wildlife trust but this is obviously something that we need to address um, and really interesting to think about why why this is the case and this was some of the results i guess on the support that's needed to allow people to do it so a lot of the time um you you look at how work is done across the wildlife trust and a lot of it is based on previous knowledge um historic understanding what other trusts are doing uh and kind of per almost personal preference in some cases um and that's not necessarily a bad thing quite often that is the right thing to be doing and um and and we you know we can see that there are benefits to doing it but we had a whole load of barriers and challenges uh coming up from trusts in terms of how to get hold of the right evidence and then to use it from um, cultural change within trusts about how we think about conservation and what it means. Uh, lots of requests for training, joint monitoring framework. I'll come back to that one because that's another of my four top uh, evidence challenges for doing nature based solutions. Accessing the right tools. Um, interestingly, and, and a really big one for us actually, is we're not able to really access the peer reviewed literature. Um, because a lot of it sits behind paywalls and we don't have the kind of university um, access that, that, that we would have if, if, uh, if we were part of a university scheme, for example. And that's a real barrier for us. It's very hard for us sometimes to even see um, and locate the right evidence because all we can really see is, is abstracts and sometimes not even that. So supporting access to primary research such as paywall journals is, is a really big one for my team in, in, in the national office. Um, but it's shared across the trusts and, and there's a whole uh, there's a whole program I think we could do on knowledge sharing and better centralised information gathering and sharing. And it's something that's been a ubiquitous problem for years and years. It's something we always used to talk about in government and at the CCC as well. And I think there have been various attempts over the years to try and crack it um, and make sure that that translation is getting through. But I think there's still probably quite an uphill battle there to try and do it particularly if you think about somebody working on a nature reserve, they don't have time to read papers. They're out, you know, doing doing work on the ground all day. Um, they're battling emails. They just haven't got the capacity uh, to go and find the evidence themselves. So making it as easy as possible for them is, is a really key one. The second challenge I wanted to talk about was how we then translate, once we've got hold of the evidence, how we translate it into practical action. Um, and this is something I, I've done on our climate change work coming into post. Uh, to try and bring together and create something that's very pragmatic and that we can implement on the ground, but is based on, on kind of robust science. Um, so we published three reports last year, sort of setting out our store really on climate change action. Again, the links are all here if anybody wants to go and have a look at any of these. Um, the document on the left was our collective approach uh, to climate action. This is where we we sort of set out kind of our ethos, I guess, on, on climate change mitigation and adaptation and nature-based solutions. So this is where sort of you can you can see um, Nat Seddon's work coming through in here and and, um, and Yavinda actually came and did a webinar for us as well on this, which was brilliant. And it really helped to get all of the trusts on the same page in terms of how we think about climate change and how we think about nature-based solutions. Um, so that's a very short document. It just sets out our kind of 10 key points, I guess, on how we think about um, climate and nature. Uh, it's got stuff on carbon offsetting in there as well um, and community engagement. And then we did two reports, the, the biggest of which was the change in nature report, which was the first time uh, we've tried to do a climate change risk assessment and an adaptation plan for the Wildlife Trust. So that's the one I just want to show you in terms of some of the challenges we have um, of doing this on the ground. And um, I was having a meeting with, with Steve Smith and his team earlier today, but we're also looking at how we how we get to net zero um, as the Wildlife Trust. We've got a net zero 2030 target, which is quite ambitious, but our emissions are relatively small. Uh, and obviously we have removals as well, but <clears throat> there's a lot around that as to how we how we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, particularly our land based um, and livestock emissions. Uh, so that's there if anybody has a specific interest in that. But the, the changing nature report, the adaptation report, was an attempt with no budget at all to um, translate all of the work I know exists around climate risks, uh, climate change projections. This is the, the role that I used to do, so I'm quite well versed in where all that information is. So I could get it in. That wasn't the problem. It was translating it into something that was usable um, for the trusts. So what we did, we did some very high level mapping 
uh, this was just me and our GIS manager doing this. So we we took some of the, the UK climate projections that the Met Office produced, um, which had been remapped into a much more user-friendly format through one of um, the UK Research and Innovation Climate Resilience Projects, which means you can just lift it off the website. Very important if you don't have a big budget. So that project really helped us. That's the UK Climate Risk Indicators Project that Nigel Arnell at Reading had been leading. And we just mapped our nature reserves over the top of it. Um, and it gave trusts a good sense, if you just look at the colours on the map of where, where how, how hazards we're going to be changing over the future and where, but particularly to get across the message that really we're expecting climate hazards to get worse everywhere, um, particularly extreme heat and wildfire and droughts, which are these three maps. Um, these are just using median projections from the UK climate projections for 2050, and these are just average conditions as well. That's another thing about communicating uh, climate projection science to, to colleagues is to point out that, you know, on, on, on a day by day basis, the changes you'll see are much worse than you tend to see in these averages maps. Um, and this was quite useful for kind of setting the broad context for a risk assessment uh, and communicating, but we couldn't do a risk assessment off the back of this kind of work. It's far too complex. You'd have to think about um, which scenarios you're using, what you would do in each scenario, do a load of modeling to go with it. It's just far too complicated and far too expensive um, for an organization like ours to, to come up with an answer based on hazard mapping. So although we did do some hazard mapping, we didn't use that for the risk assessment. Instead, I went back to the UK Climate Change Risk Assessment, which is the work I was leading at the Climate Change Committee, and looked at rather the urgency of different actions based on both our present day vulnerability and our future vulnerability as set out with the mapping we did and, and the national assessment as well. And this way of doing it, this framing makes it much easier to make decisions uh, and to come up with action plans, which is actually why we did it at the national level for the UK government, because it really gave policymakers a sense of the, the areas to prioritise. So there were no numbers in this. There's no um, probability and impact assessment, although that all sits behind the risk assessment, but it, it allows anybody to go in um, and realise their own priorities. So we redid the UK assessment, but just for the wildlife trusts, just for our local circumstances. Um, and you can come up with different prioritised areas of risk that you know you need to work on sooner rather than later. So those are all the ones in the, the more action needed box. And a lot of those relate to our nature reserves, to understanding how biodiversity is changing in the UK um, and what we can do to, to adapt to it. And just to give you a sense of what fell out of that, that exercise, uh, this is just our list of actions from last year um, for our adaptation plan which has everything from understanding how far our current nature reserve management practices go towards facilitating the movement of different species, which is quite, quite a complicated action in itself. So a lot of that is about understanding the evidence that we already have um, and the frameworks for how you think about connectivity and, and species dispersal to uh, reviewing our all of our nature reserves of different hazards, which is part of what the hazard mapping was doing, to pests and pathogens and invasive non-native species, to understanding the threat of extreme heat to our offices. Um, a lot of our offices are old listed buildings. Um, a lot of them are leased, so we can't make direct changes to them. So these are the real practical considerations that suddenly come in when you're trying to act uh, and create change. And this is where really the, the, the evidence feeding through into practical action becomes really difficult because um, it's very hard to find hyper-local evidence to help us do this. What you really wanna be looking for is the decision support tools um, and the frameworks that allow you to think through what it is you should do. Uh, and a lot of that has been stripped away. So actually ECI um, have been hosting the UK Climate Impacts Programme for the last, well, seven or eight years or so, I think, and, and UK SIP was its own government-led, government-funded organisation, not government-led, it was independent, um, that sat at Oxford for 20 years and has been absolutely incredible um, as a resource for linking decision makers and the science uh, and doing that translation exercise. And that really has now been stripped away because of the lack of government funding. So government withdrew funding from UK SIP about 10 years ago, and it's it's an absolute shame. It was a really, really important thing for decision makers to have. 
Um, I'd love to see it come back again. And I know UK SIP still exists and there's there's a, a few members of staff that are still working on it, but it'd be great to see that funding coming back because these are the sorts of things that we really need to help us make decisions. Um, two more, so monitoring frameworks. Um, I found it quite interesting coming into the Wildlife Trust from government uh, and thinking about how monitoring really works for biodiversity. Again, a lot of you will be much more expert than I am on this, but I really was surprised at how inconsistent our biodiversity data is across the country. Um, and we really do need to up our game on monitoring to ensure that we know that what we're doing is making a difference. So I mentioned at the beginning, one of my roles at the Wildlife Trust is to look after our, um, our impact measures work linked to our strategy. So measuring our effectiveness and our success and even coming up with indicators that we can measure is actually quite, quite challenging. Um, and again, going back to our evidence emergency program, uh, this was the result of the question on how, how trusts rate their ability to measure their effectiveness of their conservation work. And again, the results were interesting and, and not very many people rated it as good or excellent. So a lot of respondents were saying it's, it's not bad, but there's a lot of room for improvement. So this is something that I'm really interested in doing more work on and trying to crack over the next few years. Just an example of that, um, we've been having some, some really great discussions with Miles Richardson, uh, who's based at the University of Derby, who's um, doing a joint project with Ed Hawkins to uh, transfer the climate stripes concept to biodiversity and to create biodiversity stripes. And Miles and Ed um, and Sam Burgess have done this for uh, some of the global statistics and what they're really interested in now is whether they can do it for UK based um, species data, either species data in different locations or um, or different species, but, but UK wide. And we've had an interesting discussion where actually it's very hard for us to provide that kind of data to a project like this, which again is quite surprising. You would think the Wildlife Trust would be swimming in data that you could use in a, in a communications program, a bit like the biodiversity stripes. Um, but consistency is a real problem. So, you know, as many of you are aware, a lot of our data is collected by volunteers. It does, we do have long-term data sets for some species going back more than 40 years or so, which is about the length of time that Miles needs to be able to, to do this for different data sets. Um, but it's not consistent. So trying to plot a trend with it is probably not the best idea. That being said, a lot of our data does feed into um, uh, the MBN Atlas and, and other kind of national record centers for biodiversity data. Um, but it's, you know, it, it feels like we should be doing a better job in, in trying to do consistent monitoring and having a set of consistent data sets, really, and, and methods um, for collecting biodiversity data across the trust. So that's something I'm really interested in. The other thing that's become really apparent is real time data. So things like last year's heat wave, you know, we had a lot of media interest in how um, the extreme conditions, the 40 degree day um, and all of the heat wave conditions around that were impacting on wildlife. And we actually don't know because we don't have data that's being collected in real time looking at those impacts. The best data that, that I actually found from, from different sources was to look at um, wildlife rescue and wildlife hospital admissions. Uh, to understand, you know, what sorts of species people were bringing in. So swifts were obviously doing really badly. Hedgehogs were doing really badly, suffering with dehydration and, and, and heat stress. But it would be great to have much better data on this um, to be able to, to really understand the actions that we should be taking as conservation organisations when these conditions hit to see what we can do to, to if anything, um, to reduce the impact. So that's something that real-time data, again, AI, digital technology, there must be something in there that would that would help us to do this. Um, in a similar kind of way, we don't have consistent indicators to measure changes in uh, the adaptive capacity or climate resilience of different sites. So we have carbon for, for climate change mitigation and we're doing a lot of research on the best ways to measure carbon um, in different habitat types. So obviously we have national figures for things like uh, woodlands and peatlands, but we don't have good data or a good understanding of more open habitats, which cover a lot of the habitats of the wildlife trusts uh, to measure carbon, but we don't really have consistent metrics at all for measuring climate resilience. 
um, going back to our Aviva program, uh, so we're, we're going to be measuring um, the adaptation outcomes from these different sites that we're creating with Woodland Creation, but we're having to come up with our own metrics. Uh, and there'll be a lot of research, I think, in there that, that we'll be keen to, to have help on to try and understand how we can better, better measure these changes, changes in biodiversity as well, although we're a bit more on, on the ball with that one. Um, and in some places, we may not know what we have until it's lost. So one example of that is the Isles of Scilly Wildlife Trust. Um, are, I mean, they're, they're, they're spectacular and so interesting, and they have such an interesting array of different species on the islands for obvious reasons, because of their, their microclimate and their, their position. Um, but the trust tell me they don't even know what they don't have or they do have they they don't necessarily know all of the species that they have in different places there may be real rarities there that nobody has ever spotted um they certainly know that they have lost some species that were really unique to the islands because of climate change impacts coming so things like um, saline intrusion is having a big impact on the islands and the trust are really keen to get experts down there just to help them look um, so we're, we're in discussions with a few different groups as to, you know, whether there are people that can really help, particularly with insects um, and plant species as well. So they're, they're pretty good on birds um, and mammals. That's all, that's all very well researched, but it's these other types of species groups that, that they're really struggling with. And with climate change impacts as well, you know, they may not know what they need to be preserving and how best to do it because they just don't have the data. Um, and I mentioned the Arts of Silly Trust, I think, have three full time members of staff. Uh, so they can't do this research on their own. They really need help to do it. Um, Alderney will be the same. And we have a lot of trusts that are in a similar position. So it's not just the island trusts, but they're a really unique case where um, they can see that they have, you know, really unusual assemblages and, and really unique sets of risks as well that they're facing. So finally, on monitoring frameworks, these are the sorts of things that we want to be able to measure to measure our own impact as well. And again, these are sort of national level data sets, but also still quite surprising that we don't have good data in the UK for some of these things. So the condition of sites is one that really hampers us. We don't have good condition data for all of our nature reserves. Um, and although we do have condition data for protected sites and, and government agencies collect that, we don't have very good condition data for non-protected sites. Uh, in the marine space, we don't really have good condition data at all for protected or non-protected sites um, or the connectivity of different types of marine habitats. So that's a really um, uh, special one where we do need to have a lot more monitoring going on than we have at the minute. Um, and we don't have good data on areas that are under active restoration either. So this relates to the, the government's 30 by 30 target where we're all trying to move towards having 30% of land and sea being managed primarily for nature by 2030. Um, there's a lot of difference of opinion about where we are on that, on that target. So government uh, started off by including um, AOMBs and national parks in their calculation and said it was about 20, 25%, 24%. Uh, but we would argue AOMBs and national parks are absolutely not being managed primarily for, for nature at the moment. We think it's more like 3%. Um, the NGOs have done quite a lot of analysis on this. Uh, so where do we go from there? You know, how, what is it we're trying to measure? How do we know if somewhere is under active restoration and it's making a difference? Connectivity is a classic one that everybody, I think, knows about, but we still have issues about what's the best way of measuring connectivity between sites. Going back to my species dispersal problem with adaptation, um, understanding an easy way to do that better for, for our nature reserves and linking up with other, say, National Trust and RSPB sites as well would be really helpful. Um, we don't have a definition of people taking meaningful action for nature. Uh, this is something that's really interesting because if you if you measure um, the number of people feeding the birds and, and gardening, it's actually more than one in four people across the country, which is fantastic. But whether that's meaningful or not is the is the key question. And is it meaningful to those people? Um, so that's something we're actively involved in. And there's a whole load of metrics over urban biodiversity that, that we really want to understand more, particularly how urban um, areas that are that are being greened up, so green and blue infrastructure, what impact they have on nature and people and connectivity in cities. 
So finally, I'm running short of time, but just uh, one last thing about tunnel vision. Um, this is a much broader issue um, and goes right outside of evidence and into policy and politics as well. But I'd say one of the biggest barriers for us in, in implementing good nature-based solutions is what I would call tunnel vision, where we have policy, we have programs, we have um, individuals as well who are really influential in this space who will only think about one aspect of nature-based solutions. A lot of the time it's carbon and net zero, but not always. Some people will only think about the nature benefits. Some people will only think about the people benefits. And you will, we do see all the time, um, perverse outcomes arising from that because uh, we're investing in schemes and projects that are only doing one of the three things in, in the little triangle. Um, and we really need to flip that on its head completely and think about what are the things we can be doing across the country that are meeting all of our goals for climate change, mitigation, adaptation, biodiversity loss, health and well-being. There's probably others you could put in there as well. Um, and one of the things we're really keen to do is invest more time and resource in ways you can enable people to think in that way, because it's psychologically, it can be really difficult, particularly if you're very focused on an area and it's your job to be focused on that area. You know, it's it can almost be we see it all the time in the work we do. People will just switch off uh, and they won't engage because they just can't cope with the idea of doing you know, they can't see how it can be done uh, to think about nature-based solutions and, and a lot of other work on climate and nature in more than one dimension. So things like the IUCN nature-based solutions standard, that's something we've been involved with and have been piloting um, with IUCN. That's a really good way of something quite simple that allows you to think about a problem and, and solutions from multiple dimensions. And this is all based around the sustainable development goals. But we'd really like to understand the, the thought processes and the ways we can encourage policymakers, analysts, um, politicians to think in more than one dimension, um, particularly when it comes to nature and climate. And one of the things we try to do with every single one of our programmes is they're never just about one thing. They're never just about carbon or just about adaptation or just about people. They always have all of those dimensions built in. That's something I saw actually coming into the job. It's one of the reasons I really love working here is that was already part of the ethos um, of what the Wildlife Trust do. Uh, but we do need to measure it better and to come up with ways of, of communicating with others and showing the benefits of, of really taking a multi-dimensional approach to nature-based solutions problems. Um, so I will stop there because that's, I think, about 50 minutes of me talking. So um, I hope that's been helpful and obviously really happy to take questions and also um, pop in in a few weeks if anybody would like to, to chat about any of those examples as well. Don't want that to happen. <laughs> there you go. Um, thank you, Catherine. Uh, uh, really, really insightful and fascinating to see that broad range of actions that are there. Uh, so we can open up to questions either uh, in person here or, or maybe so, so you can look online, Stephen, or something. Or, uh, yeah. or I could and keep an eye out. Right, I could have a look as well. Uh, and while people here are formulating questions, I just thought perhaps you could elaborate a bit on on the on the rainforest program. It sounds very exciting. Uh, uh, what specifically uh, are the actions being planned there? Uh, is it to expand existing reserves, create new rainforest reserves. Uh, you talked about connectivity as well. Perhaps you want to elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, sure, Yavinda. So this is, um, so as I mentioned, it's it's come from Aviva. So in 2021, um, Aviva published uh, their intention to invest £100 million in nature-based solutions. Um, primarily, it was part of their net zero 2040 plan. Um, so it's driven partly by that, but actually partly also by their climate ready um, program, which is not mitigation focused. It's much more adaptation focused. So trying to do what they can to ensure the country is adapting to the effects of climate change properly by 2040 as well. And as, a, as an insurer, we tend to find actually the insurance companies are some of the best corporates for, for working with on nature based solutions because they really do understand the multidimensionality of it, the future uncertainty. They're good with risk. Um, so really interesting to be working with Aviva on that. Um, the program is to mainly create new reserves. Um, so woodland planting, but natural regeneration as well. So there'll be a mix of the two. Um, there will be quite a bit of research around uh, how you 
promote and encourage the, the development of a rainforest environment as opposed to just creating a woodland in an area which happens to be in the bioclimatic envelope for rainforest. So that's something where we've already done quite a lot of work on and obviously there's been quite a lot of research on rainforests, but that's something that we'll be doing an active research program on. <clears throat> and there is quite a bit of funding within this for, um, for research and monitoring uh, ongoing. And then, as I mentioned, the the program itself, so it's got multiple indicators. Um, so we're looking at measuring carbon, obviously, um, but also the adaptation changes that, that these new woodlands are having, whether it's natural flood management or shading. We're obviously looking at the biodiversity changes in these areas as well. Um, and there's a whole uh, community engagement element. I mean, that's really core to everything we do, but obviously is core to this program as well. So a lot of it will be dealing with different communities and, and opening up these areas for public access um, and doing a lot of community led conservation in them as well. The, the sites are gonna be, as you would expect across the West of the UK, um, but part of the, the first initial phase of the program is to identify those sites and then set the right conditions and start doing the woodland establishment. So um, we, we will have sites, I suspect, in the southwest of England and Wales. Um, Isle of Man is within the, the, the envelope as well, and, and uh, um, Manx Wildlife Trust are involved. All the way up into Scotland has bioclimatic envelope for, for rainforest as well. But we're really right at the beginning, it is a 100-year programme. Um, so the first thing to do is establish, you know, trying to find those areas that are going to work. Um, get the team up and running and start the research program as well. So the, the research program in particular, um, I'll be working on that and looking after it. But we do have a pot of money to start looking at some of the core research questions. So that will be things like, um, how do we think the bioclimatic envelope is going to change with climate change? And what can we do practically on the ground uh, to make sure that we're um, identifying the most important sites for, for greater connectivity? So Aviva already doing a bit of modelling around that as well. Um, so there isn't a huge amount of detail to tell you yet because we haven't done, done all the work yet, but it will be starting in earnest. And it, yeah, it'd be something, obviously, Yavinda, we'd love to talk to you about it and your team. But again, anybody else who's got particular interest in rainforest, um, that'd be great. Actually, my yeah, when I was um, studying, I was doing um, rainforest in Guyana and looking at uh, community interaction with multinational conservation organisations. So. Um, I've got a little tiny bit of background in tropical rainforests, but obviously temperate rainforest is a whole different kettle of fish. So um, we know a lot about the ecology and we have a lot of expertise in the wildlife trust on that, but the future conditions and how you um, maximize resilience uh, and maximize carbon storage as well, so that you're, you're resilient to the risk from fire and disease and drought in future is gonna be a really big one for us. Great, that sounds fascinating. Thank you. Okay, we'll open up to questions here. Um, Emily, at the back, on the microphone. Hi, uh, thanks so much for the talk. Um, it's really interesting. I was just wondering um, how the Wildlife Trust is, because obviously it's like there's lots of great funding opportunities by going into the nature-based solutions space, but they tend to be quite siloed, whether it's BNG or the existing carbon standards are very focused on carbon. And in both those cases, whether it's BNG or carbon, the outcomes for nature aren't always as prioritized as you, you might like. So how does the Wildlife Trust as like a conservation charity sort of interact with those issues? Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll unpick them one by one. So BNG, um, we're actually quite involved in the devising of the metrics for, for biodiversity net gain. So a lot of the trusts have been piloting um, with government funding things like um, biodiversity net gain banking, habitat banking, how you measure BNG, what we think of the metric and whether it's robust or not. So there's a lot of work that already happens uh, around the trust on that. Similarly on carbon accounting, obviously I'm very active in um, working with things like greenhouse gas protocol, science-based targets initiative, uh, looking at the UK codes. And we actually host um, the UK peatland program, the IUCN peatland program at the minute. Um, that's sitting within within our national team at RSWT. So very involved in, in, in that one, but Woodland Carbon Code as well, very interested in. So we, we do a lot of work with engaging with those standards and codes. Um, I spent a happy time just before Christmas trying to review the latest greenhouse gas protocol guidance on land-based emissions, which is about 500 pages. Um, so we do a lot of that work, but because our core ethos is about nature, 
the programs that we implement. So those examples I showed you, uh, regardless of the source of funding, we will always do the other things anyway. So say we say we're getting funding. Um, I'm trying to think of an, of a, of an example, but the, na the natural flood management projects are a good example. So the funding is through government or via the environment agency to do natural flood management. But we do all of the additional work to then look at the biodiversity gains from that and, and the community engagement as well. So we will just do it as a matter of course, regardless of what the, um, the core funding needs are. So that's just part of our charitable objectives that we do that. Most of our funding to date, I would say a lot of it has been grant funding. We're getting into more um, corporate partnerships, but you know, there's a lot that has to be done to look at those from due diligence um, of whoever we're working with through to um, making sure that actually we are able to do or hit all of those objectives with our funding. So it's not just being funded for one thing. The Aviv Aviva programme is a really nice one. It's actually the first time uh, we've involved ourselves in a programme like this, which has a carbon credits element because it has all of those other benefits as well. So it's not just it's not just a carbon offsetting scheme. In fact, it's not really carbon offsetting at all. Um, we have published some uh, details on the website that explain a little bit what it looks like, um, but it's it's almost a whole new way of thinking about nature-based solutions with these multiple benefits and thinking about what we need for the future. So it's very focused on um, future removals from woodlands and the biodiversity benefits and the adaptation benefits. So that's really important for us. But it does mean sometimes we have to say no. And we do, we, we have done that, you know, even since I've been in post where we have a partner approaching us who are interested in a particular thing. Um, and we won't work with them if if it means we can't do all of the other, the other benefits together. So that happens a lot. Um, but I'd say, yeah, there's, there's certainly a growing market around biodiversity credits um, as well. And that's something that we're going to be quite actively looking at to see what we think about it. And then we have to get into a lot of technicalities about what do you do about stacking of benefits, because you need to make sure that all these projects are additional um, if they're going to apply for credits. So all the all of the technical details, well, we have to know to make sure we're doing a robust approach. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of where we come at it from. I hope that that kind of gives you a picture. Uh, but if you look, if you look at all of our projects, you know, you should be able to see all those benefits coming through from all of them. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, Paul. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. So, just picking up a bit more then on this. Oh, hold on a second. Well, Paul, I can, yeah. Have you got a microphone? I just can't quite hear you. It's coming. I beg your pardon. Um, so, just bit, picking up a bit more on the uh, on the Aviva investment or whatever. So, there's 32 million. Can you just talk a bit about? more about how that is structured. So you mentioned, of course, the, these new rainforests will generate carbon credits or biodiversity credits. Is Aviva getting those credits or are you able to sell those credits or who will own those credits? Um, in Because you know, they have a market value for them. And then, um, so that was one then. And then the other bit of the structuring, how long is the 32 million structured over in terms of, of time? And then are you, to acquire the land to plant the trees, are you planning to purchase the land, lease it, or work with the landowner to to deliver it? Um, so how, how are those sort of aspects working? Yeah. yeah, that's a good question, Paul. So the first thing I have to say about this is a lot of this is still subject to commercial confidentiality on Aviva's side. So I can't divulge all the details of the contract, unfortunately. Um, but I can certainly talk in broad terms about the different aspects of it and everything you've just mentioned has been subject to lengthy discussions, um, which have taken place over the last year or so. Um, so as I mentioned, it's, it's a multi-benefit programme. So Aviva have, uh, and this is all on, published on their website, so you can go and have a look at how they um, are, are viewing themselves and how they want this to work. But they have set themselves a net zero target for 2040. They're already aiming to be net zero for their operational emissions scope one and two by 2030. Um, they want to be net zero by 2040 for all of their all of their emissions, including scope three, so their investments. They're investing in nature-based solutions because they know there will still be residual emissions from some of their investments by 2040. But they're doing a lot of active work, including divesting from coal, for example, and various other things. 
So that's all, that's quite interesting to go and have a look at um, how how they're approaching their their journey to net zero on their website, and they're signed up to Science Based Targets Initiative and everything else. The investment they're making with us is to create new habitats that will be um, so there will be woodland planting and natural regeneration to create rainforest. The the funding is to pay for that rainforest creation. Um, so that's is th so it's thirty eight million. Most of it is going into the actual, um, uh, in some cases, it will be land acquisition, planting of trees, um, and all the monitoring that, that goes on with that. It is front loaded, um, as you would expect. So a lot of the work, the program sort of sits in two phases. There's a, an establishment phase where we do all the work, um, do all the research and, and get everything going. And then there's a, a maintenance and monitoring and research phase. So the first phase is sort of 10 years. The second phase goes out to the end of the century. Um, so the, the program is structured in that way. So you have a, a very active phase at the beginning and then a very, very long um, maintenance phase where you're looking after these sites in perpetuity. And one of the, the reasons the Wildlife Trusts are a good partner for this is we have to do that. So it's again, it's within our core objectives, our charitable objectives that we look after nature reserves in perpetuity. Um, so you wouldn't have a wildlife trust selling a nature reserve um, very often, unless there's a very good reason. Um, that that is that is what we do as our bread and butter. Um, there's probably not a lot more detail I can tell you about it because a lot of it's still subject to NDA, unfortunately, because it's a contract type arrangement. But I hope that gives you a sense. Um, and yeah, if you've got very specific questions, when I come in in person in a couple of weeks, I can try and see how many of those I can answer as well. Um, there is a there is a, a credit component to it. So this is the other thing that is published. There is a carbon credit component to it, but it is not just a carbon credit program. Um, there are no biodiversity credits associated with it. So, but we are doing all of that work and monitoring it and doing the research to um, report on all of the biodiversity benefits and the adaptation benefits as well. No, thanks. Can I just come back? Because I, I think that's really significant what you're saying, actually, because it sounds to me like you as a charity and a wildlife trust are now starting to move, work as a, a carbon project developer and, and maintaining that in the long run, which is quite interesting because that's often been done more in the commercial world, hasn't it? But it, it sounds like you're acting in carbon markets, you're acting as the carbon project developer and then carbon deliverer here. Is that true to say? And hence why you can't talk about it openly. Well, the, the the reason I can't talk about all the details is because they're in a contract that's subject to an NDA. So it's nothing to do with our status. It's just because that's Aviva's IP. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't, you know, you'd, you'd have to have somebody from Aviva to come in and, and talk through that detail. Um, there's been a really, really interesting process over the last five years or so where all the nature charities have been thinking about their position in relation to carbon offsetting. Um, the document I put up in one of the slides, which was our climate change position statement, if you go and have a look at that, you'll find it on our website. That sets out our view um, and our position and how we see ourselves on carbon offsetting. National Trust, RSPB, Woodland Trust, um, all, really all the other major nature NGOs have been having the same internal discussion um, on their position. So obviously Woodland Trust have been doing this for years already. Um, and actively use Woodland Carbon Code. Um, we're using Woodland Carbon Code for this project to measure the carbon benefits of, of the rainforest restoration. National Trust and RSPB have, have been through a similar thought process as well. Um, and actually the Wildlife Trust do, some of the trusts are setting up their own schemes. So Kent Wildlife Trust have their own carbon offsetting standard called Wilder Carbon. Um, so there are different, you, you know, there's different projects going on, there's different standards. I wouldn't say it's hard to sum up in a sentence whether you see us as a deliverer. Um, we are a deliverer of nature-based solutions, absolutely. But we've already been doing that. I wouldn't say that's anything new. Uh, but I would point you to our climate change position statement because that should help to sort of set the scene on how we're approaching the whole issue of carbon offsetting. Um, we also, I mean, we do have very firm criteria for what we think would count. So we we will only work with UK-based um, projects, obviously, um, and and UK organisations that will work with us on it. Um, we only look at carbon when there are biodiversity and adaptation and community benefits. Um, we follow the IUCN nature-based solutions standards. 
And then we have criteria ourselves for what we would use in terms of the, the standards for measuring carbon, but also uh, the requirements on the organizations we work with in terms of how they're approaching net zero. So that's all that's all already published. So yeah, do go and have a look um, if you're interested. Great. Another question here then. Yeah. Well, for me, it was just a quick comment. Um, actually, he, he touched on it, uh, which is basically around the land accessibility. The same project exactly. Uh, what's your mechanism around how we're going to access the land and in relationship with the local communities who probably own the greater majority of their land? Yeah. So I think, yeah, I mean, the Wildlife Trust as a whole, um, so community engagement is at the heart of everything we do. So again, this is completely our bread and butter. Most of our nature reserves have completely open access, but they don't all do, um, because often you actually do get a conflict between um, people on site and uh, and things like ground nesting birds, for example. So on some nature reserves, will prevent dog, dogs from accessing the reserve because you know it's it's a site for ground nesting birds. So those sorts of things are in place for different reserves, but I think nearly all of our reserves are, are open for public access. Um, that will always be the case. We'll always ensure that, that community engagement is sort of there and at the heart of what we do. Uh, one of the really key things and one of our key indicators for our strategy is, at, is um, uh, distance from Wildlife Trust Nature Reserves. So, um, I think there's, we do have a statistic that every, I think, X percentage of the population, I think it's 60% or something, is within walking distance of a Wildlife Trust Nature Reserve. Um, so actually, I've got seven around me that are, you wouldn't know are there um, unless you actually go and look. But there's there's loads around Oxford. So one of them, um, if you're interested, go and have a look on the Wildlife Trust website. You can search for Nature Reserves and just type in your postcode and it will come up with all of the, the closest nature reserves to you and tell you about all the accessibility um, for those reserves as well. So it's it's absolutely what we do, you know, just as just as day to day. Um, and it, for, new, for new nature reserves and for new acquisitions we make, we've also got something that's, that's quite innovative, which is a, a philanthropic loan scheme, because one of the big barriers for us to acquiring new land is having the upfront finance. Uh, and this is a new scheme where high net worth individuals will loan us uh, with either no interest or very, very low interest, um, an upfront loan uh, to purchase new land. And then the trust pays it back over a three or five year period where they have time to do the fundraising or, or other means of, of generating the, the funds. And that's really unlocked a lot of opportunities for, for acquiring new nature reserves that we wouldn't have had before. Um, a really interesting idea just to get over one of those barriers to, to sort of upfront finance, because often you have to move very quickly with land acquisitions and Wildlife Trust can't pay over the asking price either. That's not allowed within our charitable objectives. Um, so acquiring new nature reserves and new land can often be you know, really difficult for us. And obviously with land prices um, going up as well, that makes it doubly hard. Uh, so having schemes like that that have been set up specifically with us in mind has been a really useful way of um, unlocking some of that. But yeah, as I say, I mean, all of all of our reserves pretty much have public access. And, and as I said, we have, you know, a huge amount of public engagement programs on that as well. Okay. Any more questions? I'm, I'm, I'm back. Thanks. I wonder if you could say a bit more about the trade-offs between your various aims. Uh, so in, in about 1995, it was pointed out that neglected coppice stored more carbon than uh, actively managed coppice. And yet the wildlife trusts uh, hated rewilding at the time. They fought quite hard against it and, and kept chopping the trees down. And yet now you're going for rewilding and rainforests and things like that. So I wonder, has carbon started to trump, you know, pull bouldered fertilities or something? Has the, the priorities uh, balance changed or uh, how, how do you deal with these tensions? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think, and this comes back to one of my challenges about how we use the best evidence to inform what we do for conservation. So you can see when you work for a conservation organization that there have in the past, I think, been quite fixed ideas about how things should be done whether that's coppicing or um, scrub management is another one where scrub is deemed bad <laughs> in some cases. And um, particularly if you're managing, say, a lowland heath site, you know, you want to you want to be controlling scrub for that to maintain that habitat. 
So that often is the case. A really good trade-off that um, I can see Steve in the front row, but we were discussing today was around our livestock emissions. Uh, so we need conservation grazing livestock to um, fulfill our conservation aims. Um, so often when you have grazing livestock on the land, they're fulfilling the role that a large herbivore would have done in, in historic times. Uh, and you need you need that grazing to, to maintain your habitat. Obviously all kinds of grass and habitats, this is true for an open habitat, so that you don't get woodland succession happening. Um, so we use a lot of grazing livestock across the Wildlife Trust, but we have 17,000 tonnes of methane emissions um, each year from our grazing livestock, which in the great scheme of things isn't a huge amount, but it's about, I think it's 68% of our total emissions is grazing livestock. So we've had a really interesting discussion in, within the Federation over the last 18 months about what do we do about that? The trusts would say we can't get rid of our conservation grazing livestock because then we're not meeting our biodiversity objectives, but we want to get to net zero. So how do we deal with that? So there's been you know, a lot of work to look at what are the ways we could maintain that conservation grazing but reduce the emissions with it. Um, and we've just finished a piece of research looking at what are the different options. So can you switch species? Um, can you flip from say cows to horses or, um, or something like that? Does that have a big effect? Can we start using technology? So we've got um, uh, trusts are, some trusts are piloting sort of fenceless collars where you have um, collars on the, the, the cows that sort of prevent them from going into different areas. That's quite an interesting one that, that's being tested. Um, there's also all the diet stuff that, that might be usable, but that's still quite experimental. And obviously all of our livestock is extensively grazed. Um, so it's not that they have um, supplementary feeding a lot of the time. There's all kinds of things you can think of though that, that we might be able to do to reduce those emissions. But this is the trade-off that we need these livestock on the land to be fulfilling our conservation objectives. So. That balance, there's always a discussion going on all the time about where the balance sits. But I think over time, certainly it feels like certainly climate change has come into the Wildlife Trust in a much bigger way in the last couple of years. That was the reason for creating my role in the first place. Um, and the people element has come much more to the fore over the last sort of 10 years than maybe it would have done uh, in, a, in a, um, an earlier iteration of the Wildlife Trust. And I think that's a really good thing. Uh, and it can make for lively conversations, but it, you know that's the sort of debate we have to have. Um, but it is it is always a work in progress to work out where that balance sits. Great. Okay. I think. Thank you. I think. Uh, I think we're probably trying to draw it to a close. Uh, but uh, that's been absolutely fascinating to hear the range of activities and also the ambition uh, for the for the coming decades. And look, look forward to talking more and engaging more on that as well. So thank you for presenting to us. I'm sorry you can't join us for, for a glass of wine now, but uh, <laughs> in a few weeks' time. Uh, so uh, another round of applause to, to Kathy. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, and look forward, if you're there on the 24th, looking forward to meeting you all in person and having more chats would be great. But thank you very much for having me today. Great. Thank you. Okay. Bye.